here we go. I got a microphone for this new, even cheaper tablet. My other tablet's volume uh, recording ability died, so. Uh, here we go. I'm sorry the picture ain't as good. I don't know as many people actually care, so. See how this comes out. But I can sit here and hold the book before you set the hold the, the tablet too wide. Well, so. Alright, so on one, <coughs> Carlos Castaneda, The Eagle's Gift, Chapter 3, The Eagle's Gift, Part 12, The Not Doing of Silvio Manuel. <coughs> Don Juan and his warriors sat back to allow the Nahua woman and myself room to an act of rule, that is, to nourish, enhance, and lead the eight warriors to freedom. Everything seemed perfect. Yet something was wrong. The first set of female warriors Don Juan had found were dreaming, and they should have been stalkers. He did not how, know how to explain this anomaly. He could only conclude that power had put those women in his path in a manner that made it impossible to refuse them. There was another striking anomaly that was even more baffling to Don Juan in his party. Three of the women and three male warriors were incapable of entering into a state of heightened awareness. Despite Don Juan's titanic efforts, they were groggy, out of focus, and could not break the seal the membrane that separates the two sides. They were nicknamed the drunkards because they staggered around without muscular coordination. The courier Eligio and Lagorda were the only ones with, with an extraordinary degree of awareness, especially Eligio, who was par with any of Don Juan's own people. The three girls clustered together and made an unshakable unit. So did the three men. Groups of the three Groups of the three when the rule described four was something ominous. The number three is a symbol of dynamics, change, movement, and above all, a symbol of revitalization. The rule was no longer serving as a map, and yet it was not conceivable that a narrow was involved. Don Juan and his warriors argued that power does not make mistakes. They pondered the question in their dreaming and seeing. They wondered whether they had perhaps been too hasty and simply had not seen that the three women and the three men were inept. Don Juan confided to me that he saw two relevant questions. One was the pragmatic problem of our presence among them. The other was the question of the rule's validity. The benefactor had guided them to the certainty that the rule encompassed everything a warrior might be concerned with. He had not prepared them for the eventuality that the rule might prove to be inapplicable. But Gorda said that the women of Don Juan's party never had any problem with me. It was only the males who were at a loss. To the men, it was incomprehensible and unacceptable that the rule was incongruous in my case. The women, however, were confident that sooner or later, the reason for my being there was going to be made clear. I had observed how the women kept themselves detached from the emotional turmoil, seeming to be completely unconcerned with the outcome. They seemed to know, without any reasonable doubt, that my case had to be somehow included in the rule. After all, I had definitely helped them by accepting my role. Thanks to the now wall woman and myself, Don Juan and his party had completed their cycle and were almost free. The answer came to them at last through Silvio Manuel. His seeing revealed that the three little sisters and the Gennaro were not inept. It was rather that I was not the right Nawal for them. I was incapable of leading them because I had an unsus unsuspected configuration that did not match the pattern laid down by the rule. A configuration which Don Juan as a seer had overlooked my luminous body gave the appearance of having four compartments, when in reality it had only three. There was another rule for what they called a three-pronged Nawa. <coughs> I belonged to that other rule. Silvio Manuel said that I was like a bird hatched from the warmth and care of birds of a different species. All of them were still bound to help me 
as I myself was bound to do anything for them, but I did not belong to them. Don Juan assumed responsibility for me because he had brought me into their midst, but my presence among them forced them all to exert themselves to the maximum, searching for two things, an explanation of what I was doing among them and the solution to the problem of what to do about it. Silvio Manuel very quickly hit upon a way to dislodge from their midst, it, upon a way to dislodge me from their midst. He took over the task of directing the project, but since he did not have the patience or energy to deal with me personally, he commissioned Don Juan to do so as his surrogate. Silvio Manuel's goal was to prepare me for a moment when a courier bearing the rule pertinent to a three-pronged Nawal would make himself or herself available to me. He said that it was not his role to reveal that portion of the rule. I had to wait just as all the others have to wait for the right time. There was still another serious problem that added more confusion. It had to do with Lagorda and in the long run with me. Lagorda had been accepted into my party as a southerly woman. Don Juan and the rest of his seers had attested to it. She seemed to be in the same category with Celia and Delia and the two female curries. The similarities were undeniable. Then Lagorda lost all her superfluous uh, weight and slimmed down to half her size. The change was so radical and profound that she became something else. She had gone unnoticed for a long time simply because all the other warriors were too preoccupied with my difficulties to pay attention to her. Her change was so drastic, however, that they were forced to focus on her. What they saw was that she was not a southerly woman at all. The bulkiness of her body had misled their previous scene. They remembered from that, from the first moment, they remembered that from the first moment she came into their midst, Lagorda could not really get along with Celia, Delia, and the other southerly women. She was, on the other hand, utterly charmed and at ease with Melidia and Florinda, because, in fact, she had always been like them. That meant that they were, that there were two northerly dreamers in my party, Lagorda and Rosa, a blatant discrepancy with the rule. Don Juan and his warriors were more than baffled. They understood everything that was happening as an omen, an indication that things had taken an unforeseeable turn. Since they could not accept the idea of human error overriding the rule, they assumed that they had been, if they had made an error, an error, by superior command. They had been made to error, oh, sorry, I can't say that word, by superior command, for a reason which was difficult to discern, but real. They pondered the question of what to do next, but before any of them came up with an answer, a true southerly woman, Donna Soldad, came into the picture with such a force that it was impossible for them to refuse her. She was congruous with the rules. She was a stalker. Her presence distracted us for a time, and for a while it seemed that she were going to pull us off to another plateau. She created vigorous movement. Lorinda took her under her wing and instructed her in the art of stalking. But whatever good it did, it was not enough to remedy a strange loss of energy that I felt, a listlessness that seemed to be increasing. Then one day, Silvio Manuel said that in his dreaming he had received a master plan. He was exhilarated and went off to discuss his details with Don Juan and the other warriors. The Narwhal woman was included in their discussion, but I was not. This made me suspect that they did not want me to find out what Silvio Manuel had discovered about me. I confronted every one of them with my suspicions. They all laughed at me except for the Nawa woman, who told me that I was right. Silvio Manuel's dreaming had revealed that the reason for my presence among them had revealed the reason for my presence, that I would have to surrender to my fate, which was not to know the nature of my task until I was ready for it. There was such a finality in her tone that I could only accept without question everything she said. I think that if Don Juan and Silvio Manuel had told me the same thing, I would not have acquiesced so easily. She also said that she disagreed with Don Juan and the others. 
She thought I should be informed of the general purpose of their actions, if only to avoid unnecessary friction and rebelliousness. Silvio Manuel intended to prepare me for my task by taking me directly into the second attention. He planned a series of bold actions that would galvanize my awareness. In the presence of all the others, he told me that he was taking over my guidance and that he was shifting me to his area of power, the night. The explanation he gave was that a number of not doings had presented themselves to him in dreaming. They were designed for a team composed of Lagorda and myself as the doers and the Nawal woman as the overseer. Silvio Manuel was awed by the Nawal woman and had only words of admiration for her. He said that she was in a class by herself. She could perform on a par with him or any of the other warriors of his party. She did not have experience. She could only manipulate her attention in any way she needed. She confessed that her prowess was as great, he confessed that her prowess was a great a mystery to him as my presence among them, and that her sense of purpose and her conviction was so keen that I was no match for her. In fact, he asked Lagorda to give me special support so I could withstand the Nawal woman's contact. For our first not doing, Silvio Manuel constructed a wooden crate big enough to house Lagorda and me. If we sat back to back with our knees up, the crate, the crate had a lid made of lattice work, lattice work to let in a flow of air. Lagorda and I climbed inside it and were to climb inside it and sit in total silence without falling asleep. He began to let us enter the box for short periods. Then he increased the time as we got used to the procedure until we could spend the entire night inside it without moving or dozing off. The Nawal woman stayed with us to make sure that we would not change levels of awareness due to fatigue. Silvio Manuel said that our natural tendency under unusual conditions of stress is to shift from the heightened state of awareness to our normal one and vice versa. The general effect of the not doing every time we perform it was to give us an unequal sense of rest, which was a complete puzzle to me since we never fell asleep during our night-long vigils. I attributed the sense of rest to the fact that we were in a state of heightened awareness. But Silvio Manuel said that one had nothing to do with the other, that the sense of rest was a result of sitting with our knees up. The second not doing consisted of making us lie on the ground like curled up dogs, almost in the fetal position, resting on our left side our foreheads on our folded arms. Silvio Manuel insisted that we keep our eyes closed as long as possible, opening them only when he told us to shift positions and lie on our right side. He told us that the purpose of this not doing was to allow our sense of hearing to separate from our sight. As before, he had gradually increased the length of time until we could spend the entire night in auditory vigil. Silvio Manuel was then ready to move us to another area of activity. He explained that in the first two not doings, we had broken a certain perceptual barrier while we were stuck to the ground. By way of analogy, he compared human beings to trees. We were like mobile trees. We were somehow rooted to the ground. Our roots are transportable. But that does not free us from the ground. He said that in order to establish balance, we had to perform the third not doing while dangling in the air. If we succeeded in channeling our intent while we were suspended from a tree inside a leather harness, we would make a triangle with our intent, a triangle whose base was on the ground and its vertex in the air. Sylvia Manuel thought that we had gathered our attention with the first two not doings to the point where we could perform the third perfectly from the beginning. One night he suspended the gorder and me in two separate harnesses like strap chairs. We sat in them and he lifted us with a pulley to the highest large branches of a tall tree. He wanted us to pay attention to the awareness of the tree, which he said would give us signals 
since we were its guests. He made the Nawa woman stay on the ground and call our names from time to time during the entire night. While we were suspended from the tree, an innumerable t in the innumerable, innumerable times we performed this not doing, we experienced a glorious flood, flood <laughs> of physical sensations, like mild charges of electrical impulses. During the first three or four attempts, it was as if the tree were protesting our intrusion. Then after the impulses became signals of peace and balance. Silvio Manuel told us that the awareness of a tree draws its nourishment from the depths of the earth, while the awareness of mobile creatures draws it from the surface. There is no sense of strife in a tree, whereas moving beings are filled to the brim with it. His contention was that perception suffers a profound jolt when we are placed in states of quietude, in darkness. A hearing takes the lead then, and the signals from all the living and existing entities around us can be detected, not with our hearing only, but with a combination of the auditory and visual senses in that order. He said that in darkness especially, while one is suspended, the eyes become subsidiary to the ears. He was absolutely right, as Lagorda and I discovered through the exercise of the third not doing. Silvio Manuel gave a new dimension to our perception of the world around us. He then told Lagorda and me the next set of three not doings would be intrinsically different and more complex. These had to do with learning to handle the other world. It was mandatory to maximize their effect by moving our time of action to the east to the evening or pre-dawn twilight. He told us that the first not doing of the second set had two stages. In stage one, we had to bring ourselves to our keenest state of heightened awareness so as to detect the wall of thought. Once that was done, stage two consisted of making that wall stop rotating in order to venture into the world between the parallel lines. He warned us that he was aiming, that what he was aiming at was to place us directly into the second attention without any intellectual preparation. He wanted us to learn its intricacies, intricacies without rational, rationally understanding what we were doing. His contention was that a magical deer or a magical coyote handles the second attention without having any intellect. Through the forced practice of journeying behind the wall of fog, we were going to undergo sooner or later a permanent alteration in our total being, an alteration that would make us accept the world between the parallel lines as real, because it is, it is part of the total world, as our luminous body is part of our total being. Silvio Manuel said that he was using Lagorda and me to probe into the possibilities that we could someday help the other apprentices by ushering them into the other world, in which case they could accompany the Nawal Juan Mateus and his party in their definitive journey. He reasoned that since the Nawal woman had to leave the world with the Nawal Juan Mateus and his warriors, the apprentices had to follow her because she was their only leader in the absence of a Nawal man. He assured us that she was counting on us, that this was the reason she was supervising our work. Silvio Manuel had Lagorda and me sit down on the ground in an area in back of his house where we had performed all the not doings. We did not need Don Juan's aid to enter in our penis, into our teeny state of awareness. Almost immediately I saw the wall of fog. Lagorda did too. Yet no matter how we tried, we could not stop the flotation. Every time I moved my head, the wall moved with it. The Nawal woman was able to stop it and go through it by herself, but for all her efforts, she could not take the two of us with her. Finally, Don Juan and Silvio Manuel had to stop the wall for us and physically push us through it. The sensation I had upon entering into that wall of fog was that my body was being twisted like the braids of a rope. On the other side, there was the horrible, desolate plain with small, round sand dunes. 
There were, there were very low yellow clouds around us, but no sky or horizon. Banks of pale yellow vapor impaired visibility. It was very difficult to walk. The pressure seemed much greater than what my body was used to. LaGorda and I walked aimlessly, but the Nawal woman seemed to know where she was going. The further we went away from the wall, the darker it got and the more difficult it was to move. LaGorda and I could no longer walk erect. We had to crawl. I lost my strength and so did LaGorda, and the Nawal woman had to drag us back to the wall and out of there. We repeated our journey innumerable times. At first we were aided by Don Juan and Silvio Manuel in stopping the wall of fog. But then LaGorda and I became almost as proficient as the Nawal woman. We learned to stop the rotation of the wall. It happened quite naturally to us. In my case, on one occasion, I realized that my intent was to keep a special aspect of my intent because it was not my volition as I know it. It was an intense desire to be it was an intense desire that was focused on the midpoint of my body. It was a peculiar nervousness that made me shudder, and then it turned into a force that did not, that did not really stop the wall, but made some sort, some part of my body turn invol involuntarily, 90 degrees to the right. The result was that for an instant I had two points of view. I was looking at the world divided, in two by the wall of fog, and at the same time I was staring directly at a bank of yellowish vapor. The latter view gained predominance, and something pulled me into the fog and beyond it. Another thing that we learned was to regard that place as real. Our journeys acquired for us the factuality of an excursion into the mountains, or a sea voyage in a sailboat. The deserted plain the sand dune like mounds was as real to us as any part of this world. The Gorda and I had the rational feeling that the three of us spent an eternity in that world between the parallel lines. Yet we were unable to remember what exactly transpired there. We could only remember the terrifying moment when we would have to leave it to return to the world of everyday life. It was always a moment of tremendous anguish and insecurity. Don Juan and his warriors followed our endeavors with great curiosity, but the one who was strangely absent from all our activities was Eligio. Although he was himself a peerless warrior, comparable to the warriors of Don Juan's own party, he never took part in our struggle, nor did he help us in any way. Regorda said that Eligio had su succeeded in attacking, attaching himself to Emilito, and thus directly to the Nawal Juan Mateus. He was never part of our problem, because he could go into the second attention at the drop of a hat. To him, journeying into the confines of the second attention was as easy as snapping his fingers. The Gorda reminded me of the day when Eligio, unusual talents allowed him to find out that I was not their man long before anyone else even had an inkling of the truth. I was sitting on the back porch of Vincente's house in northern Mexico when Emilito and Eligio suddenly showed up. Everyone took for granted that Emilito had to disappear for long periods of time. When, and when he showed up again, everyone also took for granted that he had returned from a voyage. No one asked him any questions. He would report his findings first to Don Juan and then to whoever wanted to hear them. On that day, I was with it was as if Emilito and Eligio had just come into the house through the back door. Emilito was a ebullient, he was excited, as ever. Eligio was his usual quiet, somber self. I had always thought, I had always thought, when both of them were together, that Emilito's exquisite personality overwhelmed Eligio and made him even more sullen. Emilito went inside looking for Don Juan, and Eligio opened up to me. He smiled and came to my side. He put his arm around my shoulders and placed his mouth to my ear, whispering that he had broken the seal of the parallel line, and he could go into something he said Emilito had called glory. Eligio went on to explain certain things about glory, 
which I was unable to comprehend. It was as if my mind could only focus on the periphery of that event. He explained it to me. Eligio took me by the hand and made me stand in the middle of the patio looking at the sky with my ch chin slightly turned up. He was to my right standing with me in the same position. He told me to let go and fall backwards, pulled by the heaviness of the very top of my head. Something grabbed me from behind and pulled me down. There was an abyss behind me. I fell into it, and then suddenly I was on the desolate plain with dune-like mounds. Eligio urged me to follow him. He told me that the edge of glory was over the hill. I walked with him until I could not move any longer. He ran ahead of me with no effort at all, as if he were made of air. He stood on top of a large mound and pointed beyond. He ran back to me and begged me to crawl up that hill, which he told me was the edge of glory. It was perhaps only a hundred feet away from me, but I could not move another inch. He tried to drag me up the hill. He could not budge me. My weight seemed to have increased a hundredfold. Eligio finally had to summon Don Juan in his party. Celia lifted me up on her show shoulders and carried me out. Magorda added that Emilito had put Eligio up to it. Emilito was proceeding according to the rule. My career had journeyed into glory. It was mandatory that he show it to me. I could recollect the eagerness of Eligio's face and the fever with, with which he urged me to make one last effort to, effort to witness glory. I could also recollect his sadness and disappointment when I failed. He never spoke to me again. Lagorda and I had been so in involved in our journey and our journeys behind the wall of fog that we had forgotten that we were due for the next not doing of the series with Silvio Manuel. He told us that it could be devastating, that it consisted of crossing the parallel lines with the three little sisters and the three Janeiro directly into the entrance of the world of total awareness. We did not include Donna Soldad because his not doings were only for dreamers and she was a stalker. Silvio Manuel added that he expected us to become familiar with the third attention by placing ourselves at the foot of the eagle over and over again. He prepared us for the jolt, he explained, that a warrior's journey into the desolate sand dune is a preparatory step for the real crossing of boundaries. To venture behind the wall of fog while one is in a state of heightened awareness, or while one is doing dreaming, entails only a very small portion of our total awareness, while to cross bodily into the other world entails engaging our total being. Sylvia Manuel had conceived of the idea of using the bridge as a symbol of a true crossing. He reasoned that the bridge was adjacent to a power spot, and power spots are cracks or passageways into the other world. He thought that it was possible that Lagorda and I had acquired enough strength to withstand a glimpse of the eagle. He announced that it was my personal duty to round up the three women and the three men and help them get into their keenest states of awareness. It was the least I could do for them, since I had perhaps been instrumental in destroying their chances for freedom. We moved our time of action to the hour just before dawn or the morning twilight. I dutifully attempted to make them shift awareness, as Don Juan did to me. Since I had no idea how to manipulate their bodies what I, or what I really had to do with them, I ended up beating them on the back. After several grueling attempts on my part, Don Juan finally intervened. He got them as steady as he possibly could and handed them over to me. Okay. To herd them like cattle onto the bridge. My task was to take one of them by take them one by one across the bridge. This power spot on the south side is very um, auspicious omen. Silvio Manuel planned to cross first, wait for me to deliver them to him, and then usher us as a group into the unknown. Silvio Manuel walked across, followed by Eligio, who did not even glance at me. I held the six apprentices in a tight group 
on the north side of the bridge. They were terrified. They got loose from my grip and began to run in different directions. I caught the three women one by one and succeeded in delivering them to Silvio Manuel. He held them at the entrance of the crack between the worlds. The three men were too fast for me. I was too tired to run after them. I looked at Don Juan across the bridge for guidance. He and the rest of his party and the Nawal woman were clustered together looking at me. They had coaxed me with gestures to run after the women or the men. Laughing at my fumbling attempt, Don Juan made a gesture with his head to disregard the three men and cross over to Silvio Manuel with the daughter. We crossed. Silvio Manuel and Eligio seemed to be holding the sides of a vertical slit the size of a man. The women ran and hid behind La Gorda. Silvio Manuel urged all of us to step inside the opening. I obeyed him. The women did not. Beyond that entrance there was nothing, yet it was filled to the brim with something that was nothing. My eyes were open. All my senses were alert. I strained, my, I strained myself trying to see in front of me, but there was nothing in front of me. Or if there was something there, I could not grasp it. My sense did not have the compartmentalization I have learned to regard as meaningful. Everything came to me at once, or rather, nothingness came to me to a degree I had never experienced before or after. I felt that my body was being torn apart. A force from within myself was pushing outward. I was bursting, not in a figurative way. Suddenly I felt a human hand snatch me out of there before I disintegrated. The Narwhal woman had crossed over and saved me. Eligio had not been able to move because he was holding the opening. Silvio Manuel had the four women by their hair, two in each hand, ready to hurl them in. I assume that the whole event must have taken at least a quarter of an hour to unfold, but at the time it never occurred to me to worry about the people around the bridge. Time seemed to have been somehow suspended, just as it had been suspended when we turned to the bridge on our way to Mexico City. Silvio Manuel said that although the attempt seemed to be a failure, it was a total success. The four women did see the aperture through <coughs> and through it into the other world, and what I experienced in there was a true sense of death. There is nothing gorgeous or peaceful about death, he said, because the real terror begins upon dying. With that incalculable force you felt in there, the eagle will squeeze out of you every flicker of awareness that you have ever had. Silvio Manuel prepared Lagorda and me for another attempt to explain that power spots I, go here? Oh, I lost my spot here. The power spots were actual holes in the sort of can canopy that prevents the world from losing its shape. A, a power spot could be utilized as long as one has gathered enough strength in the second attention. He told us that the key to withstanding the ego's presence was the potency of one's intent. Without intent, there was nothing. He said to me that since I was the only one who had stepped into the other world, which had nearly killed me, was my, was my, what had nearly killed me was my incapacity to change my intent. He was confident, however, that with forced, with, that with forced practice, all of us could get to elongate our intent. He could not explain, however, what intent was. He joked that only the Nawal Juan Mateus could explain it, that he, that he was not around. Unfortunately, our next attempt did not take place, for I became deplenished of energy. It was, swift, it was a swift and devastating loss of vitality. I was suddenly so weak, I passed out in Silvio Manuel's house. I asked Lagorda whether she knew what happened next. She, I myself had no idea. Lagorda said that Silvio Manuel told everyone that the eagle had dislodged me from their group and that finally I was ready for them to prepare me to carry out designs to carry out the designs of my fate. His plan was to make me take me to the world between the parallel lines while I was unconscious. 
and let and let that world draw out all the remaining and useless energy from my body. His idea was sound in the judgment of all his companions, because the rule says that one could only enter in there with awareness. To enter without it brings death, since without consciousness, the life force is exhausted by the physical pressure of that world. The Gorda added that they did not take her with me, but that the Nawal Juan Mateus told her that once I was empty of vital energy, practically dead, all of them would turn would take turns in blowing new energy into my body. In that world, anybody who has life force can give it to others by blowing on them. They put their breath in all the spots where there is a storage point. Sylvia Manuel blew first, then the Nawal woman. The remaining part of me was made up of all the members of the Nawal Mateus' party. After they had blown their energy into me, the Nawal woman brought me out of the fog to Sylvia Manuel's house. She laid me on the ground with my head toward the southeast. Lagorda said that I looked as if I were dead. She and the Gineros and the three little sisters were there. The Nawal woman explained to them that I was ill, but that I was going to come back someday to help them find their freedom, because I would not be free myself until I did that. Sylvia Manuel gave me his breath and brought me back to life. That was what that was why she and the little sisters remembered that he was my master. He carried me to my bed and let me sleep as if nothing had happened. After I woke up, I left and did not return. And then she forgot because no one ever pushed her into the left side again. She went to live in the town where I later found her with the others. The Nawal Juan Mateus and Gennaro had set up two different households. Gennaro took care of the men, and Nawal Juan Mateus looked after the women. <clears throat> I had gone to sleep feeling depressed and feeble. When I woke, I was in the perfect control of myself, a Julian, a Julian, I guess, you know, excited, filled with extraordinary and unfamiliar energy. My well-being was mine only by Don Juan's telling me that I had to leave Lagorda and strive alone to perfect my attention until one day when I would be able to return to help her. He also told me not to fret or get discouraged, for the carrier of the rule would eventually make himself or herself known to me in order to reveal my true task. Afterward, I did not see Don Juan for a very long time. When I came back, he kept on making me shift from the right to the left side awareness for two purposes. First, so I could continue my relationship with his warriors and the Nawa woman. And second, so he could put me under the direct supervision of Zulika, with whom I had a steady interaction throughout the remaining years of my association with Don Juan. He told me that the reason he had to entrust me to Zulika was because according to Silvio Manuel's master plan, there were to be two kinds of instruction to me one for the right side and one for the left. The right side instruction pertained to the state of normal consciousness and had to do with leading me to the rational conviction that there is another type of awareness concealed in human beings. Don Juan was in charge of this instruction. The left side instruction had been assigned to Zulita. It was related to the state of heightened awareness and had to do exclusively with handling of the second attention. Because every time I went to Mexico, I would spend half of my time with Zulika and the other half with Don Juan. That's the end of the chapter. And now let's see if I can shut my little cutty off here.